before um, opening it out to the floor for questions, one of the topics we were discussing just before we came to the room was the question of the European elections and that wonderful clash between policy and politics mm. and um, how European elections are both held and what is the likely outcome going to be. So I'm just going to ask each of the speakers, maybe starting with you, Paul, this time, is what is going to happen in the context of the European election at an internal Austrian point of view and how that's going to have an impact then on the wider European politics? Okay, well, I, I'm optimistic uh, concerning the, the, the elections to the European Parliament in 2019, 26th of May in, in, in Austria. Why? Because, because the, the, the political landscape is, in Austria is, is different than it was in, in 2014. We will, have, uh, we will hold the EU presidency uh, second semester of 2018. We will try to bridge uh, the second semester with, with May 2019 try to get the public attention to, to the elections. There's a lot of more debate about European issues due to Brexit, economic uh, turbulences, and migration issue. Austria, having been one of those countries uh, which was actually a recipient country of, of migration. And, um, and also on the political landscape, I mean, the, the far right uh, FPÖ is now a government member and much more moderate on EU issues. So it would be very difficult for them to, to go anti-EU, being a co coalition member. On the other hand, you have the Social Democrats. In the past, EU, EU elections were a sort of um, way of saying no to the current government. And now the, um, you have pro-European elements in the government and you have pro-European elements in the opposition. That's why, not, why I'm optimistic about it. And I think uh, this time, I mean, the de debate will be on domestic issues as always, but this time you can actually uh, bridge make it happen that domestic issues, uh, that, there are also, that also the European elements of the domestic issues will be discussed. I'm positive that the turnout will be slightly higher than it was last time. Okay, Paul, you're uh, talking about how Brexit possibly is an opportunity for Spain. Does that feed into a positive mood in the context of an election? In the EP elections, I mean. Um, yeah, we were discussing that before. I think uh, what we will see in the, in the run-up of the EP elections in Spain, of course I agree with Paul here and probably with Agatha, that uh, uh, these uh, elections are played on a national scale. Huh? And this, they serve the purpose of either punishing or rarely rewarding the government, more punishing than rewarding. But, uh, and, and in Spain, what is interesting to see ahead of the new elections in the European Parliament is that most probably we will see the consolidation of something that is happening across Europe and is the changing dynamics of the political spectrums in, all in many countries. What I mean by that is that in, if in 2014 it was Podemos who won the European Parliament elections, it won those elections out of the complete overhaul of the political spectrum in Spain because of the euro crisis. Huh? And of course all the unemployment and all the discontent with uh, Spain kind of merged together into the victory of Podemos. Now, most probably, what we can see in the next European elections is how Ciudadanos wins those elections, the European Parliament elections. Why? Because they will take place in the middle of the Catalan crisis. And the Catalan crisis has clearly benefited Ciudadanos in the national uh, configuration. So what we will see in Spain, most likely, is that the two main parties, the Popular Party and the Socialist Party, will be replaced out of the center of the elections by Podemos and Ciudadanos. And it is quite possible that this kind of refurbishment of, of, the, of the Spanish political spectrum will have an impact then on the European Parliament. The big question remains whether if we put all the countries together and the outcome of these elections uh, at the European Parliament, whether these trends of refurbishing of the of the refurbishment of the of the national landscapes will translate into a refurbishment of the European Parliament itself, in the sense that we were discussing that before, whether the socialists and the popular party at the European level will kind of start losing their grounds as the two central forces of the European Parliament. That, of course, is not up to Spain only, but we will see whether if the, Spain, the Spanish case also uh, kind of uh, uh, happens in, in, in other countries, and that's it. How do you see it, Agata? Will the future of Europe be a big discussion, or will the tensions between Warsaw and Brussels more dictate things? Well, I would start from saying that whereas I can see the elections to the European Parliament being a platform for protest movements, for anti-EU movements in many member states, I don't see it happening in Poland. And this is mainly because we don't have any serious political party 
any political movement which would be advocating either Poland's departure from the EU or basically which would have very Eurosceptic uh, Euro roots. This is why I can still see the debate between the mainstream party and you know the current government, even though it is more skeptical about the deeper European integration, it is still seen in the realm of being a mainstream a mainstream uh, uh, party. So uh, having said this, I mean, what will be interesting to see is whether actually Europe will play any role in the political debate. Because mm. back in 2014, it didn't play a significant role. Uh, basically, very few heard about the elite candidates. And I think actually very few bothered to visit, uh, to visit Poland. Um, uh, but this time round, I think I agree with you, that might look s slightly different, mainly because indeed Poland is now, uh, th there is this ongoing political row, political dispute between the Polish government and Brussels over the rule of law. So I can see basically this topic being used by both the current government, uh, arguing that it will defend Polish interest in Brussels, and then I can see it also uh, uh, in the manifestos of other uh, parties currently in the opposition. Um, so uh, from this perspective, that might uh, play a role. And of course, a big topic, I think, which will feature in the, uh, in the campaign, that will be the next multi-annual financial yeah. uh, framework, which has always been a very important portfolio uh, uh, for, for Poland, which has been up till now and will continue uh, being a net recipient. Okay, it's just approaching two o'clock. I think it would be nice to open it out to the audience. Could I ask you to say your name and I'll take a couple of questions and then field it to the panel. Yes. Hi, Charles and Jacobs. Um, thanks for three very interesting uh, perspectives. Oh, for three very interesting perspectives. My question would be, um, don't you think maybe that in the next few years the biggest challenge to the European Union is, certain, is not going to be a copycat referendum to the Brexit referendum, but how the EU responds to internal challenges, because there's always been a huge reluctance to criticize individual member states. And we see this obviously, and this I suppose is mainly to Agatha, but also interesting in, to Paul, about enforcing <laughs> EU values, the whole challenge to EU values from Poland and Hungary in particular, to some extent in Spain, with everyone backing, saying there shouldn't be too much violence from Rajoy, but backing Madrid against uh, the uh, Catalan independence. Mm -hmm. And now I fear we're going to see a similar challenge coming from Italy, because either Salvini or um, uh, Cinque Stelle are po going to pose challenges if they're going to carry out their word. Salvini this morning said, I don't want to, uh, um, to have a referendum on the euro. The euro is lousy. I don't want a referendum on it, but I want to escape from some of its constraints. Mm -hmm. And Cinque Stelle's policy says we don't want to follow the constraints of the fiscal compact. Mm -hmm. So I think there are going to be some big challenges from whatever government emerges within Italy. And I'd like to know how they think the, the panel thinks the EU will respond to these different Challenges. Mm -hmm. That question alone mm -hmm. could take up a half an hour, but we'll take a second. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need it? Yeah, just. Uh, hello, my name is Deirdre de Burke. I'm a member of the Institute, and um, thank you very much for your presentations. I think you could describe your presentations, all of you, I think, as quite nuanced. You weren't overwhelmingly positive, but you know, you were pointing to the challenges and the, the problems facing Europe. But I suppose my question to you is. I'd like to put it to all of you, do you think there is too much complacency about the future of Europe? I mean, when you look at, and we've been talking about the member states, at the weakened state of many of the governments of the European Union, where the parties of the centre, the more establishment parties, are being replaced or increasingly squeezed out by parties of the right and the left, we have other governments that are fundamentally questioning the uh, values, the liberal values of the EU, you have a uh, divided public opinion about the EU because, well, maybe linked to the EU's support for austerity and implementation of austerity, but for other reasons as well. It's increasingly divided publics. You have Brexit, as somebody mentioned, as a possible trigger for other countries. So every member state now beginning to question itself, like, should we consider possibly leaving the EU? <coughs> you have uh, the possibility of a reduced budget. I mean, somebody mentioned member states are considering increasing their contributions to the EU budget, but it's likely overall in the discussions on the multi-annual financial framework, which uh, was a multi-annual uh, framework, 
that it's going to be a reduced budget available um, you know, for, uh, at the EU level, and also uh, that there's many external threats, so an increasingly assertive Russia, increasingly assertive uh, China, uh, the US destabilising the international economic order that the EU has been a beneficiary of. So with all of those combined threats, and mostly the fact that there is no inspiring political vision about the future of Europe, even Macron, who you've referred to, you know, speaks about modalities for promoting the deeper integration of the EU, but actually hasn't really said much that's inspiring the public of Europe, those that are inclined to support the idea of a more integrated European future with a political vision or a political narrative of some kind. So my question to you would be, do you think we should, there should be a greater sense of urgency and, and concern about this, the situation in which Europe finds itself at the moment and what can be done, do you think, to try to uh, address that rapidly? Thank you. Just because those are two extensive questions, I'm going to go back to the panel and then we'll reverse to the audience. Maybe I could. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, all uh, uh, very, very good questions. Uh, perhaps I, I should start from enforcing EU values. Not an easy, not an easy topic. But I agree with you that um, whereas the EU has been pretty good at imposing conditionality. Uh, towards uh, EU's neighbourhood, it hasn't been particularly efficient in bringing individual member states to heel, sort of, uh, and and making sure that the EU democratic values, those um, defined in Article Two of the Treaty on the European Union, uh, are uh, uh, either sort of. Um, safeguarded or abided by. So, but I think that this is um, this is changing. Uh, at least the logic or the sort of the thinking within the European Commission corners is slightly changing. Um, as you know, the Commission didn't actually hesitate to recommend that the Council uh, uh, triggers Article Seven against uh, the Polish government, and I would deliberately use the word Polish government rather than Poland. Um, and you know, this is something which uh, still, I would say, you know, six months, one year ago, was unthinkable uh, for 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 many of us. Now the question is, will it make any difference? Uh, it probably wouldn't make any difference because these are member states uh, who basically uh, pull the strings when it comes to either uh, executing uh, whatever comes with Article 7 and actually uh, bringing individual member states to heel because it's up to them to take a decision on those issues. And member states have been reluctant, uh, reluctant to point to individual members for backtracking either because they need a backing of individual member states in certain policy areas or because they don't like a commission coming to their countries and saying that they misbehave. And there are other, other, other reasons. Um, having said this, uh, I think that you, know, that you cannot really cast a blind eye on, on backtracking on the rule of law uh, because it also undermines EU's power of, of example. And, and you mentioned that actually the enlargement is coming back to the fore, to the fore again. And that's something that uh, the sort of complacency undermines EU uh, power of example. But just to interrupt and interject, mm -hmm. on that there were other options, more forceful options that the Commission could have triggered, but it chose to <laughs> What take are you alluding to? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, yes. So th there are other... So this, so let, me, let me also be clear, because that's, I think, something we need to put into, into, uh, into perspective. And the problem is that uh, there are various tools that, that you could use vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis a member states which is backtracking on the rule of law, but many of them are simply not addressing the problem of backtracking on the core EU values. So, for example, you have infringement procedures, yes, but you could use the infringement procedures only when a member state is uh, violating a central EU law and violating a sort of backtracking on the democratic values. But you could not really use them when there is backtracking on the rule of law, but no EU uh, on, on the rule of law, but there is no violation of certain EU regulation. This is this is why also Article 7 is being considered. But there are also ideas now being floated in, in the European Commission that perhaps there should be a greater conditionality in how the structural funds are being dispersed. Um, and that should be tied up with the respect for the rule of law. If you ask me for my personal opinion, I think that's tricky. I think that the idea is particularly tricky because it is defined in a way that it, it is targeting those member states which have benefited 
from structural funds, whereas there are various member states in the EU uh, which have issues with the rule of law. Yeah? These are not only new, new, new member states, but I think that there is this idea being crystallized right, uh, right now that there should be certain conditionality perhaps tied up with an economic conditionality, with the conditionality for structural uh, reforms. And this is a discussion that the Polish government will have to face and will have to uh, uh, consider it seriously. Do you mind if I yeah. address other, uh, other questions? And if I'm too yeah. sort of long-winded, just cut me off. <laughs> um, I think uh, Italy, also you mentioned Italy. Uh, Italy is, is an extremely interesting example because what we are facing today or what we witnessed yesterday sh shows that uh, a window is closing uh, for any reform of the Eurozone. Yeah? Something which we fought with uh, election of Macron and actually now uh, Chancellor May Merkel being back, uh, I, I can find it difficult with, with whatever the situation we find ourselves in Italy, particularly in the context of the banking uh, union reform, uh, or basically completing a banking union. I think, I think uh, Italy poses a huge challenge to this. And this leads me to your, to your question uh, about complacency. Uh, is the EU complacent about the reforms and EU's future? Yes, absolutely. And um, I, I did uh, conduct a research where I was looking in different positions of, of different member states towards the future of the Eurozone. And even although everyone sort of realizes that certain reform is needed, I agree with Paul, uh, basically there is no way the Eurozone could strike a consensus anytime soon on what is needed, on whether we need more fiscal, uh, whether we need fiscal union or whether we need a greater responsibility from uh, individual, individual member states. The problem is that basically we uh, and now we face a sort of economic upturn, yeah? And, and that is a challenge because that could mean that basically the leaders will sit down and say, well, since we are facing economic upturn, since actually the support for the euro is growing, well, maybe we should deal with only the basics uh, which are needed. And this is, uh, it seems to me, uh, an approach that the European Council has taken, yeah? Banking union, uh, perhaps capital, uh, capital markets union, and we will leave other things for later. Well. That is, that is posing a great challenge because at some point the EU citizens will say, look, we want the Eurozone to provide security, prosperity. Huh? And if the Eurozone is not delivering on this, well, then at some point they might turn back on, 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 on the project itself and vote the way they might vote in the European Parliament's elections. I think that comes back to in the UK, in the, in the British election, there was this constant argument that the euro, in, in, regarding its introduction, there was a case of mis-selling, that financial term, <coughs> talk with the positive, don't deal with the negative. And yeah. it comes back to that question of honesty as well. But Paul, from your perspective? Yeah, just ad adding up to, to, to what Agatha was mentioning, I'm picking up some of the comments. Um, I think overall, we, we have a great problem here in uh, taking a longer term perspective. We have a great problem in the EU that we, we tend to go from optimism to pessimism to optimism to pessimism again in, 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 in a matter of days. Huh? And, that, and that's problematic for, for an organization such, an, uh, such as the EU, which is built on a longer term perspective for that matter. And, and, and I think that we, I mean, first it was France, you know, of course, it was France, and, and if France falls under Le Pen, then it's the end of the story. Then it was the Grand Coalition, it was Germany, you know, if, if we don't have a German kind of good engine, then nothing will happen. Then it was Italy, you know, if Italy is, it falls back, then it's, it's over, it's, it's the end of the story. Okay, let's take a, a wider perspective on, on the EU and try to abolish this immediate politics that we are all kind of... Uh, uh, focusing on on the Twitter basis. Huh? That's what news does. Uh, that's what news. Uh, yeah, but, but we are like in a, in a situation where I mean, this is this is kind of philosophical thing, things here. But but what I mean is, I mean, our societies nowadays, I mean, have a hard time into first accepting the reality that political answers are more difficult than political questions. And we want to have kind of an immediate response to things that per se take time. And second, we are not able to see that 
the public opinion cares much more about politics, not only national, but European politics. So the combination of both makes European Union politics even more difficult than before. What I would like to say with that is that I think we should take a longer term perspective and look at what has happened after Brexit today if we ask again the same question. Would you rather leave or would you rather stay? Would you rather leave the European Union? Would you rather leave the Eurozone or would you stay? And the trend is that Brexit is difficult, that once you start the procedure of getting out of the Union, then a lot of bad things happen. So if a lot of bad things happen and things are com even more complicated than you thought after casting the ballot on, on that referendum, then perhaps we should also try to see a wider perspective and say, OK, maybe, maybe the trend is telling us that the EU is not so bad idea, such a, not, not such a bad idea, and that, that perhaps people want to stay. Problems are there. Uh, tomorrow's election is crucial and nothing will happen before that election. Yes, but let's try to provide a more, more kind of long term perspective. Sorry, but I think that this, is, this needs to be done. And in Spain, in Spain, um, something that I didn't mention and which is I'm very critical on Spain. I'm Catalan and of course I have my issues with, with Spain. But something that Spain is positive about is that Despite all the effects of the euro crisis and so on, we have no eurosceptic or europhob uh, pop, um, party within within the big uh, big parties in Spain, and it is unlikely that this will happen. Well, this is good news. I mean, this is good news for Spain in the sense that this kind of pro-EU feeling is here now, and it was here thirty years from now no? when we when we access the the European Union. Which perhaps should I say a word on Catalonia? Or, well, yes, or, I think that would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because, because I was compelled to, to what answer What would be the one this. word that you would say on Catalonia? <laughs> the one word on Catalonia would be Catalonia. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, for, that's for sure. That's for sure. No, but, but uh, on Catalonia, I think that, of course, the EU has had a very bad time in positioning itself on Catalonia. Why? Because it has too many crises on the plate, and, of course, adding a new one, be, so uh, questions such as Catalonia, would be a nightmare. And this has been the policy that has, that has followed the, the EU, following the Prodi doctrine. Uh, the, if a member state decides to leave, uh, if part of a member state decides to, to secede and thus to, to, to leave that country, it also leaves the European Union. So this is the official, the official policy. What I'm much more critical about is that whether the European Union has tried to depoliticize the, the, Catalan, the Catalan question for good reasons, Spain has tried to act it exactly in the same way has tried to act as if this was not a political problem in, in, in Spain. And I think it is the major political problem that Spain is confronting nowadays after the 78, uh, so since 78 and the uh, return of, of democracy to, to, to Spain. So what I would argue about Catalonia is I would agree that this is an internal affair with the European Union. I am a bit more cautious in saying the European Union can do anything. Well, something it can do. Tusk tried to. Tusk tried to position himself as the person who could foster dialogue. But mostly, I would say that this is a question that, since it is an internal question for Spain, some political dialogue has to unfold, because this is certainly a political crisis, and this is certainly a political problem for Spain. So I'm very, very uh, negative on, the, on, on both sides when they have tried to say no, this is not a problem in, in, in Spain. I can go into further detail, but let's leave it here. <laughs> Paul, you from Austria. Yes, uh, on, I think on EU values, almost everything was said. I mean, the, the, the issue is also that, that, of course, we have, in the end, it's the member states that take a decision, and, then, and there you have a coalition building and unanimity, which makes it difficult. <clears throat> on the complacency, on the complacency issue, I, I think that's that's a very very important point that you made, and and what can be done? Yes, that's the question. Um, well, I think, at least from our point of view, what we need is is uh, find recipes to uh, increase the national ownership of the whole European agenda. Um, we probably need. Um, we need a reality check on expectations. Um, so many things are expected from the European Union because, because we don't really know what the competences are. So we need people telling us who is in charge of what. Um, what, what is it that the European level can actually do? What is it that, uh, that member states do? Um, we, 
in many, many speeches, we hear national politicians saying, well, the EU shall do this and that. But it's actually the member states who are sit on the table when the decisions are taken. They are present. They can make proposals. They can argue. They can search for coalitions uh, for, the, for their priorities. And this is something which is not really perceived by, by the wider public, which thinks that there's the EU, which doesn't do enough. We expect so much from them, but they do not uh, fulfill on these expectations. And this is also where the sovereignty issue comes in. No? This whole concept of, of sovereignty, which is, is uh, somehow a, a concept of, of the 19th, 20th century, which we need to discuss. Um, and, and Macron tried this, but of course this is a little bit of an intellectual discussion. I mean, uh, who, who, really, uh, who really gets into this, this discussion? But we also need more honesty in the sense that um, what we do is we monitor how our members of the European Parliament de decide and vote. But we don't really have a clue in real time how our, how our uh, representatives of the national governments decide in the council. Yeah. Now you can say, you can say well, um, the lack of trans transparency makes sense because if, if you don't, if, you, if everything is made public, you do not really talk openly, no? But in the end, people want to know where their countries stand. And, 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 there, and every decision which is taken, you have a participation of an Austrian uh, member of, of government, but we don't, really, we don't really hear about it. People don't know about it, and that's where this, this confusion comes in. I think to, to a certain extent, the, um, a journalist myself would have to accept some of the responsibility. I mean, there is a difficulty in the EU progression of law that it can go on for so long that there isn't a beginning, middle, or end to it. But there is that issue of competence and education and information giving as to yep. how decisions are taken. And if that isn't explained, then the public isn't going to know, which leads to situations that you should do something. So. Exactly. And the timing is also an issue there. I mean, keeping in mind how complex the European Union is with all these different interests, yeah. we're not doing that that bad, in fact. Okay. But if we... Just two points. If, if we say that well, we just decided on banking union, or it's Friday and we just solved the economic crisis, and then it's Sunday and nothing is solved, and it takes two more years to get the whole thing implemented, which is quite quick for a banking union, but in the eyes and the perception of the people, well, you just said that you've decided it. Why, why don't you do it? Mm -hmm. And my last point is that on, and, and this is where the whole discussion on the EU budget comes in. I mean, this, it's not just about numbers, it's about priorities and expectations. What do we want the European Union to do? To do? If we want them to, to actually successfully manage our external border, they need, they need the, the money and the resources to do so. And sometimes, well, the money is one thing, it's just 1% of, of the EU GDP. But, but if you actually, uh, if you actually successfully pool your, your, your resources, public procurement, you name it, in security and defense and other areas, this is where the real money is. It's not so much the 1% of the GDP, which is so much in the headlines. And this is also not said often enough and not debated often enough. But I, I agree with you. We just need more, more debate and more transparency in this debate. That would be my, my point. But how to get the national politicians to do so, that's a different story. Well, that's usually because um, success is nationalized and failure is Europeanized and round the circle goes. We used up half of the time already on two questions. Um, did you wish to raise a question? Any more now? Yes, just at the back there. Hello, Brother Connor. Uh, two questions. The first is, what is the European project about now? We know what it was when it started. We know the external threats. We know the history. <coughs> Second question. Yesterday, Switzerland had a referendum on giving the federal government the power to tax for the next 20 years. I think it doesn't come into effect until, I think, sometime in the 20s. Um, the other referendum they had yesterday was on thing of domestic interest here, renewal of the public broadcasting license fee. Um, um, is that a model? To, for uh, those of us in Europe to follow, that there must be some kind of a more direct engagement on big issues, like the, the, the budget, um, and, um, and if not, why not? 
Yes. <laughs> Could I actually comment on what has been sure. said before I just take those questions? Uh, very, very quickly on, on accountability. Uh, Paul is saying basically we know very little on what is happening uh, uh, in, in the Council or in the European Council. Well, um, I will provoke a discussion here and say, well, then we should ask perhaps our MPs, whom we directly elect, to go and ask the government uh, what, uh, what it has decided. Or perhaps before it has decided, the, the parliament should hold them simply accountable. And I think we very often forget this element that there is this direct uh, sort of there, there is this democratic legitimacy which is being drawn uh, from uh, national parliaments and actually I think that the Irish parliament is an interesting case study because ever since the crisis uh, started and Ireland has been obviously severely hit by crisis the Irish MPs actually started looking into EU affairs and as far as I'm concerned I looked into those issues uh, already many years ago created certain committees which would be debating also uh, uh, sovereign debt crisis and financial crisis uh, more thoroughly. So that, that's, that's a trend and parliaments also are sort of gearing up and, and learning how to use their scrutiny powers. On, on, post, on post comment, on maybe we should be looking into the fact that basically overall post Brexit there is this increase in the support for the EU. Well, I'm not that, I actually think that putting it this way is actually being complacent. Because I think if you look into the support for Euro, and I think we discussed it already before on, on a different occasion, yes, there has been an increase in support for the Eurozone project, around I think 60% now, the, the, the highest ever since inception. But my question in such circumstances is always, yes, do those people really support the Eurozone project or they simply think that there is no alternative? Yeah? Because what would happen if the country was about to leave the Eurozone? And basically, they would, uh, you know, the, 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 the catastrophe, the crisis would happen. Yeah? So the question is, are they really fully embracing the project? And that's the same with, for example, the Polish people. They're overly optimistic about the European project. More than 80% support the, uh, Poland's membership. But if you ask them, you know, uh, follow-up questions, if you touch upon on sovereignty issues mm. or some issues that they are not perfectly comfortable with, they will be more split. So I think this is where a sort of uh, um, greater knowledge information should be coming coming into for And now, um, so <laughs> and now the question on uh, direct democracy. I think that's an extremely uh, extremely difficult question. And uh, coming from the country uh, which just voted to leave the EU, and I must say I followed uh, uh, a debate with a despair where basically. Um, um, uh, there was very little uh, uh, about the EU as such, <laughs> and actually, uh, th there mainly we were sort of, or basically, the, the campaigners were spreading myths rather than rather than facts. So my answer would be. Obviously, we should be engaging citizens more directly. There's already some top, uh, sort of bottom-up uh, initiatives taking place, uh, like Ireland, as, uh, as far as I'm concerned, holding civil, civic dialogues. Yeah? And President Macron has just announced that he will be uh, holding democratic conventions, but Ireland has been doing this for the last couple, couple of years. And I think that a uh, referendum can be a useful tool only if we have a certain platform and, uh, uh, and as long as we have a certain institution which will be holding to account those uh, camp, uh, various camps and whether it would, uh, uh, if we have an uh, organization which would be simply scrutinizing them whether they're saying facts or myths and once the public actually knows what it is voting for and what the consequences could be, then, yes, I might say that I would entertain the idea of democ direct democracy. Because there is a big debate here. We have a referendum commission which is supposed to be assisting the public to determine yeah. facts and questions whether it should be put on a permanent footing. But when you replicate, when, you're, when you examine what happened in Brexit and continues to happen, it's quite I disturbing. Think, yeah. Yeah. Um, just we've only got eight minutes left, so I'm going to divide yeah. it up between you four. Yeah, yeah, no, very quickly. Um, on, on Also on referenda, um, I mean, you rarely get the answer that you are uh, looking for when you, when you ask for such a referendum. You, you, you will most probably get an answer that is totally biased in, 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 the, in, in, in regards to the questions that you are asking. I mean, I think that on that matter, it's always the case that we compare that to Switzerland. Hmm? But it's very difficult to, 
compare this, the, the Brexit referendum for the matter of Spain or Spanish referendum to Switzerland because at least in Spain we don't have the tradition of holding this kind of referendum because referendum is not only about voting, it's partly about voting, but it's also having an informed campaign, it's also having a, a clear question and a clear answer that can be provided to that question. So it's a whole system of functioning, it's not only having a question put to the ballot box and people going and answering. And this is clearly the case in the UK. You, you had a question, you did not ask about the single market membership. You did not ask about the consequences of, uh, 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 of the different areas that you will have to rebuild the whole of your uh, legislation because of your 40 years belonging to the EU. So all these things were not answered asked in a question. So I, for binary choices, which are very complex, I would, unless you're Switzerland, I would kind of uh, avoid uh, going uh, to, through That's that path. Right. But I think that your, your question is, re the, the first question is very relevant because it, what is the EU project about now? And I think, I think this is a very relevant question. I think I will tell you what I think it's not, hmm? which <laughs> is the easy way to get out of this. But I think that something that has really been lost since the crisis, multiple crises, is the sense of the EU as a positive sum game. Huh? I think that every country has tried to, what's, what's, what's for me out of this union? Huh? What, what should I get from, what is my benefit from belonging to the European Union? I think that to a certain extent, what we've lost in, in the, in the, in, 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 through, the, through the crisis that we've been through is the, the, the sense of a trans, transactional politics. Huh? So I don't see any country today saying, okay, I'm happy to give you a bit of this on this area that you are demanding because I will get that reward from the rest of the negotiations. So I think that this mentality, which is, by the way, the core mentality of the European Union yeah. project, is what has been lost in sense of what is the EU now. So to a certain extent, I'm also very uh, negative or very uh, uh, pessimistic if the whole of the EU reform is about Eurozone reform, I think that we should provide kind of a vision that em encompasses more topics on EU uh, reform than the Eurozone. I would like to see a dynamics whereby Germany, who is a very reluctant leader in security and defence, acknowledges that it needs to give up something on the Eurozone because perhaps it needs more on the security and defence file. So this kind of combination of our topics, be that defence, be that uh, Eurozone or be that uh, uh, refugee policies, I think that this overall sense of what the EU is about, which is a shared project on shared policies on many different, of very different nature, this is something that should be brought back into the equation. So not focus on only on one specific issue about EU integration, which is what benefits me. Oh, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's something bigger than that. Well, can you maybe pick up on that, particularly the idea that the cockpit of the EU is the Eurozone and it's going to continue dragging everything else into the centre because that's where the core is going to be? I agree with what you just said. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 I sincerely believe that, that the core, I mean, even within the Eurozone, there are many, many multi-speed integrational developments, okay? But the, the Eurozone and the common currency between the 19 countries is, is one thing, one important thing, economic factor which they have in common, which, uh, which in fact, uh, has its impact on many, many other, other issues, in particular concerning the, the question of, of sovereignty, which, which needs to be dis discussed. Can I make two points on, on the question that, that was raised uh, on, on direct democracy? Um, I agree with what was said before. I believe that we have seen many, many uh, bad examples of direct um, democracy from the Netherlands to Greece, from Hungary to, to the UK. Um, I, I think uh, they were all done and dealt with uh, in a different way, with a different purpose. People, you can pose whatever question you want, but if you don't know how to do direct democracy, if you don't, you don't know how to use this instrument, people will re re reply whatever they want to reply. And even in Swi even Switzerland has problems with it. If you if you think of the the referendum, the vote on on the question of of mass immigration towards Switzerland, uh, well, of course, I mean you you had a slight majority uh, in favor of ending the the free movement of people to Switzerland, 
But then all the, the other bilateral treaties that Switzerland has with the with the European Union would would have fallen, and and uh, and that's why the politics had to try to to find its way a little bit around it, uh, and that cannot be the sense of direct democracy. Okay, uh, even Switzerland has has its challenges, and uh, by the way, I think I think uh, I'm of course completely biased. I think the vote in favor of of uh, publicly financing uh, public uh, broadcasting uh, was was a good thing in in Switzerland because in times of in times of fake news and the question of the the, the impact of social media and and, and the challenge that all the the, the, the public uh, broadcasters have in, in in many countries I think that's, that's that doesn't mean that that public broadcasters don't have to reform um, and get more efficient, but, but they have a role to play, I think, which is important. Uh, on EU, uh, what project is it now? Well, it's, it's, it's the art of compromise, I think uh, that's, that's for sure. And it's, uh, depending on whom you ask, you get a different answer. I mean, for, for, for millennials, for people who are 18 uh, or older, younger, they, they have a total different approach to this. For them, this is all natural, this is all given. And others would say, uh, these things can change, we have to fight for them, we have to be very careful and, and sensitive. And these, um, you have to take into account these cross-border sensibilities and particularities, and I think that's where the, the, the consensus-driven machinery, this inclusiveness, I think is a value in itself. And it's this art of compromise, which sometimes makes the European Union um, appear uh, a, a, a very slow moving train, uh, which does not really reach the, the station and which has, has problems in, in, in taking efficient decisions and implementing them, them. But at least we try to have everything, everyone on board. And I think that's a value in itself. Mm -hmm. You spoke there about millennials and the different perspectives, not just across countries, but uh, between ages. And uh, when I was with Barry Andrews in Maynooth University, not far from here, um, I was speaking about my, my experience and my value of the European Union was uh, as this peace project. Mm. And I spoke about sort of dynamic shifts like the um, end of the Berlin Wall. And there was one student sitting at the back and says, that's history. Yeah. You are my sense, <laughs> so history. For her, it was about education. It was about opportunities, it was about travel, it was about employment, mm -hmm. that's what yeah. Europe was. Mm -hmm. But it was wonderful to get that perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think today it's been excellent to hear from Austria, to hear from Spain, to hear from Poland, and get a sense of where we are in a very changeable world. And to Paul, Paul and Agatha, mm -hmm. I'd like to say thank you very much.